Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Roxy Hunt. I'm one of the festival directors for the Lower East Side Film Festival. Um, and this is the In the Biz short showcase, uh, which is, you know, films about films, films about the business, the industry, um, the ups and downs, the good, the bad, the ugly, the awkward. Um, so we're really excited to have all of you guys here with us today. Um, and just, just confirm you guys can hear me okay. My mic's good. Awesome. Um, and yeah, we've got filmmakers from um, uh, Ghostal Galaxies, from Marsha, from Dame, and hopefully from Avalanche if Molly jumps in at the end. Um, so welcome, you guys. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, and like I said, we'll kind of go around and, and hear from each of you. So just to kick it off, um, let's start with the, the guys from Marsha. We've got Rowan and Aiden. Hello. Hello. Hey. How are you guys? <laughs> thank good, you for good. having us. Really glad really, to be. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are brothers. We are. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, tell us, give us a little log line for those who haven't seen the film. Tell us a little bit about uh, your film. Go ahead. Uh, you got uh, it. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> uh, Marsha is uh, is is about um, a pair of brothers, one of whom is a sort of a washed up um, actor who's having a, a bit of a low point in his career, and uh, his younger brother, who is starting off as a, as a director and is directing his first feature, and it stars his washed up uh, older brother, and um, things take a uh, 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 things take Dark a turn. turn. Things <laughs> Dark take a turn. Um, and how, tell us a little bit about that process of, of where did this idea come from? Is this based on true events? You are both brothers, so how did it come to this story? I was not based on all that <laughs> true, in, uh, any of true events. It was, after you'll see the movie, it's uh, a good thing that it's not based on anything true, but um, and it really fact, came about, yeah. Go our ahead. relationships, you know, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> Would have been hard to make a movie about our relationship being yes. so shitty. You know. Yes, <laughs> uh, but really, it started off. I wanted to write a play. I was I was doing a lot of theater in New York, and I wrote this one act idea, and then I sent it to Aiden, and you know, we just we thought, well, maybe, maybe this might make a really good short film. Um, yeah. We actually we 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 were like a few weeks away from shooting, and our uh, producing partner was like, you know. Like, I just, there's got, I, I think there's got to be a little more conflict here. And right. we were like, no, oh, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it is what it is. And right. then we started arguing about something totally stupid. And he was like, yeah, that's, that's what it <laughs> that's should be. What should, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was an organic, an organic progression. Uh, well, so Rowan, you play the director, Aiden, you play the actor, but you're both also acting in it. You know, how did the how did you guys navigate the, the hierarchy potentially of um, you being the director, him being the actor, you know, there's a lot of like um, power dynamics at play in the film. Um, what was it like to navigate that in the real world? <laughs> well, I definitely wanted to put him, I mean, cause he's, he has a fear of, of clo uh, close spaces. He's a little claustrophobic and he doesn't like scorpions or bugs. So I thought, what can I put into my script that's really gonna get a good performance? And uh, I thought putting him in a small Both hole of those things, and, yeah. and then also putting in some bugs would be good. Um, <laughs> using, using it all, you know, to our benefit. We don't, I don't, we don't really have a, I mean, we work together on lots of stuff and, yeah. and uh, you know, we're always like forced to do that by our, our, our parents growing up. So we, I, hierarchically, I don't think we really have those kind of, those kind of issues. Which, I think we naturally fall into the roles that we actually want. <laughs> Aiden wants his little control and I, I want a different part of the project. So it all kind of works out usually. Which one is older? Okay. I just pointed at the computer. Yes, that one. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's a good story about kind of it's not necessarily a coming of age, but this kind of coming to grips with your, where you're at with your career and, you know, where you want to be at. And, you know, I'm just Word. curious too, like, yeah. where, where do you, do you guys see each other continuing to work together? Um, or, you know, what's the, what's the future like for you guys? 
Yeah, definitely. Well, I liked I like what you just said about, yeah, it is kind of a coming of age story. And I'm, I'm glad that you said that because that's, yeah, not many people make that observation, but it's, it's sort of a coming of age story that you're looking at maybe 10, 12 years later down the line. Like you're kind of reanalyzing the coming of age story. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely work together. I mean, we already have a bunch of new stuff on, uh, yeah. in the can, ready it to go. Ongoing, ongoing yeah. stuff, a lot of writing stuff. But we're excited to make some things that are sort of outside the, the filmmaking realm. We, we love dabbling in this because, you know, it's really fun to make movies about making movies. It's, it's, uh, it's hysterical often and, and oftentimes you can get some really nice truth. But, um, you know, we got a lot of stuff up in, uh, on, in the batter's box. We grew up in the business, so it's hard to, uh, I think we, we, it's hard for us to find a way to tell different, we're going to have to sort of branch out, maybe uh, experience <laughs> the world a little bit, uh, <laughs> tell, yeah. tell some story. We don't really know what else, we don't know what else is going on in the world, you know. Right. But it was nice being able to bring in a very like real relationship to this sort of already very tried and true uh, platform of like writing out about the industry. So we're excited to, yeah, keep kind of working those relationships in. Maybe you can use the, the trauma of the closed space and the bugs on set to inspire your next. I think that <laughs> might be right. I think that's good. I it's use it every day. <laughs> yeah. Were those, so were those, how did you guys go about that? I mean, that was, that, you know, was there any uh, stories from the set that, in, um, that you can share with in, in around those bugs and all that? Rowan was building that box for like the entire week leading up to shooting. It's this, you know, Rowan's a sculptor as well. And uh, he, he spent, you know, days and days crafting this beautiful, uh, you know, realistic, uh, you know, rock cave looking thing. And we're kind of, we're <laughs> like, you know, we're gonna make some like decisions about, you know, the shot list and everything like that. He's like, no, I'm you know, gonna be in my cave covered in plaster. <laughs> um, that was that was a bit of a challenge, but it ended up looking really cool. Yeah, we found a, and, found a yeah. bug guy for the scorpion. We got a bug guy, but Aiden is you know pretty scared of of bugs, and Fucking you know being it. in a small Hit place. <laughs> uh, so you know we obviously couldn't get the scorpion in the box with him simultaneously. So we had to not for lack of trying. Yeah. <laughs> So we, we had to get like another day of shooting and like then recreate this cave because anyway, by that time the cave had already been torn down because this thing was massive and nobody would keep it anywhere. Oh. Even though we wanted to keep it. <laughs> but you don't have space for that in your backyard or something? Yeah, I know, I know. No one wanted to turn it into a bed, like one of those kids' beds. <laughs> like a little tiny home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, put that on Airbnb. You guys can yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, that's that's awesome, and thanks for for sharing. Um, yeah, thank you. Fun film to watch too, and and I think that's why we were excited about the showcase because it it's fun to see movies about movies or people working in the industry and that kind of thing. So totally, yeah. Um, Looking forward to seeing everybody else's movie. Yeah, yeah really are. Um, I want to kick it over to uh, the ladies from Dame, um, and we've got Grace and Foster. Um, now tell us a little bit about the film and also what roles you guys, what hats you wore um, on this film, because I think there was multiple hats being worn. <laughs> yeah. Grace, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'm Grace, and I wrote Dame and also played uh, the lead role of Elizabeth Taylor and was um, the EP of the project. And Foster is my director and a co-producer. Yeah, so I came onto the film. Uh, I think Grace has been working on this project and uh, as a short and also the feature script as well um, for a long time and had been working, uh, developing it and working with her acting coaches on it. And I came in last summer through a mutual friend um, and she had asked if, if this was a project I might be interested in very kindly gave me this, this job. So we, uh, so we started working together last summer and, uh, and yeah, and so I was director and, and co-producer on it as well. So Grace, tell us um, what a little bit about this, what the film is about for those who haven't seen it and, and where you came to land on this idea. Absolutely. So I started working on this project um, for my love of Elizabeth Taylor. She was my favorite actress growing up in National Velvet. I grew up watching that film over and over again. So I always wanted to do something with her life and her story. Um, and as I kind of did my research and learned more and more about her, I realized the way that her narrative had been told was just so skewed from the actual truth. 
So she was an amazing woman ahead of her time. She was like one of the leaders of changing the old studio system in Hollywood. Um, so I decided to take this moment in her life and kind of tell it from a female perspective. And when she was shooting Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, her husband, Mike Todd, was killed in a plane crash. She only got two weeks off and had to come back to set and finish shooting the film, which is obviously a story about grief and the loss of love and all of these things that she was actually going through at the time. And I was like, why hasn't anybody told me this about Elizabeth? No one's ever mentioned this story to me. Um, so I chose this specific moment. The film takes place on her first day back on set after Mike Todd has been killed, um, just to give her a moment of breathing. Like what was this world icon going through in order to get back up on her feet and move through grief and also be a woman at work. She had a six month old baby at the time and she was supporting her parents and two other children. So it was just this incredible moment for her to be both a human and Elizabeth Taylor. So that's kind of the story of Dane. Well, and you got lucky that you happened to resemble her quite. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of an awkward thing. And I like honestly rejected it for a long time because people would bring it up to me. And it was just really like, you know, I just wanted to be my own human in life. And eventually you just kind of lean into it and roll with it. And again, honestly, the, that's the like, least similarity we have. As I started preparing for the role, I actually prepared um, in New York City with Susan Batson. So I'm really honored to be part of Lower East Side. I love New York. Um, it really brought me home to Elizabeth. Um, and in our preparation, you know, there was just a lot of other things that people don't really understand about her because I think we haven't really taken the time to look at her as a human being and a woman. And so when we look at that, you know, she was a very compassionate woman. She led from her heart. She believed in love and she fought for those things. And I think as we move into this new world, um, post-pandemic, post all of the things that we're moving through, we need to kind of look at our female leaders in a different way and the things that they can bring to the table that are equally, if not more important than other you know, leadership qualities that we tend to value in society. So it's definitely a political film. You know, it's a, it's a small moment in a grand woman's life, but there's a lot going on in the project. So we wanted to bring all of those things to the forefront. And we also had, you know, direct, uh, foster our female director and all female department heads um, everybody, most of the people behind the camera were women or people of color. And so we really wanted to give this, um, you know, a different perspective than the way that we normally see stories told in Hollywood. Yeah, I, I mean, and I, that's, I mean, that's great to hear. And I, um, I commend you for that, um, for creating a set environment that way. Um, do you feel like there was a pressure to uphold, um, you know, re recreating someone's life or, you know, a, tr a person um, who's such a well-known figure? Um, did you kind of feel like, how do I, you know, accurately portray this, this person or, you know? Yeah, I took it very, very seriously. Obviously, you're not just going to like pick up and say like, I'm going to play Elizabeth Taylor today. Um, I really honor her and her fans, you know, it's a, it's a big responsibility and I took it as a duty to do her justice. Um, I was very, very fortunate to have some of the best um, coaches in the world prepare me who specialize in biopics. Um, I have a movement coach here in Los Angeles and then obviously Susan Batson in New York City. And um, I prepared for about nine months, um, just getting into her body, getting into her character. And then along the way, just the most magical things started to happen. Um, like I started meeting people from her life. Um, the people who made my costume actually made all of Elizabeth Taylor's or most of Elizabeth Taylor's dresses from like the 1950s until she died. Um, and like the people that worked there had actually known her. Um, my makeup artist uh, used to do her makeup. Um, so just like a lot of magical things took place in, in the telling of it. And I kind of, I felt like it was, I don't know, destiny in a way. Yeah, and we did, you know, Grace had done so much work by the time I came on board. Um, and we were working with her movement coach. I uh, consulted with him over the phone too. And then when Grace and I started working together, I think a lot of the pressure was really there because Elizabeth means so much to Grace. And I think what we, what we worked on was, 
taking, trusting that she had done all that work and letting it go a little bit and letting herself come through and really playing, you know, this moment right now and who you are in this moment right now, what this story is about, because all of the work she had done was already there. Her mannerisms and her way of walking and all of that was, was present. So we just had to, we had to get into where we, where we are right now. And that was kind of the shift that happened once, once we started working and rehearsing. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, a future idea of uh, expanding on this short or, or different, you know, tell us about that. Yes, we're definitely just getting started with the retelling of Elizabeth's story. And so there's a couple future projects in development right now. Um, one of them being a feature and then a couple other things we can't talk about yet, but we're really excited. Um, there's just, her life is just so epic and she touches like every part of history during the time that she was alive in a really profound way, um, and especially like women's rights. And if she called herself kind of an accidental feminist, she didn't consider herself a feminist. But again, she was just like so ahead of her time. Um, so I really think there's just such an opportunity um, for women and the world to take another look at her story and what she offered all of us. Has anyone, you mentioned you, you come in contact with some folks that actually knew her, have any of those people seen the film yet or it's not really out there yet? It's not out there. I was very, very honored to meet her former assistant of 25 years and he did watch the film and um, liked it very much. And um, I, I won't go into too many details because it was a very personal moment, but I will say that the number one thing I learned about Elizabeth um, in the preparation was that it was never really about her. Um, she was truly a woman of service. And what she gave, she gave for her love of the world and her fans and humanity. And he did say that um, I was the first person that had told him that, and that that was true. So that was really special. That's amazing. Well, well, congratulations and, and job well done to you guys. Um, it was also great to see that film come through. It's just a kind of unique perspective, something we hadn't really seen before. So um, I appreciated it a lot. Um, and I think you, you very much captured her look too. I mean, obviously you know that, but yeah, I think that um, it was kind of striking. It was like, whoa. <laughs> so, uh, well, awesome. I want to uh, move over to William and um, talk about his film, Ghostal, Ghostal Galaxies, um, which is a departure from the stuff that we've been talking about here because it's a, you know, doc film. And um, I think, uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about the documentary and, you know, your subject and how you came to um, find yourself uh, tracking down his story. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing, everybody. Uh, really honored to be here. Uh, I'm, in, I'm from Florida, so um, it's, it's great to be um, recognized up there, the Lower East Side. Um, I was hoping to get up and visit Caroline Weaver. I know that she's got a pencil store in Lower East Side. My previous documentary was um, on the pencil. So this piece, um, this one was a random uh, occurrence. I teach at a small uh, liberal arts college here in Lakeland, and I got that random phone call one day and it was like the administration. They're like, hey, we've got this guy that was in the broadcast industry. You want to have him come in the classroom? You know, and at that point, I'm like, okay, we're going to have this, you know, over AI, you know, come hang out, you know, it's, uh, you know, how interesting can this be? Um, you know, because we're, we're thinking like, you know, big, inter you know, interactive media and technology. I'm going to have this radio guy come in my classroom. And when he came in my classroom, I just fell in love with this character. And, um, you know, he's, he's wearing Andy Warhol um, Converse shoes, and he was just off the wall. I, I thought I was going to get fired. <laughs> I mean, he was so, he was just so, such an interesting guy. Um, and the students just really connected with um, his creativity. And it was a beautiful thing. So it was at that point where I just started probing a little bit, you know, and I knew him coming in the classroom at that point. I started to research him a little bit before I brought him in the classroom and then like, whoa, okay, this guy's pretty significant. Really, this is an honor to have him in the classroom, but he had just moved from Atlanta. He was with uh, Cartoon Network, um, but I don't know if you guys know the um, voice of Space Ghost. And that's who this individual is. So my, my log line is, um, you know, he's weaving in these twisty surrealist jabs 
uh, all the time. That's what drew me to him. Just his, his intellectual curiosity and his creativity, like I mentioned, is beautiful. And um, so as you start to, you know, I was spending a lot of time with him before I even started shooting and just discover this huge obsession with artwork and this, this dichotomy between, you know, like sustaining life from a financial standpoint and then his um, obsession with art, and which is still extremely relevant right now. Uh, but then, you know, I started the production process with him and just wanted to do more of an observational, wasn't really looking for a lot of conflict and things like that. Um, but right in the middle of the shooting, his mom passed. And um, that was the hard, um, hard point uh, in the project itself. Um, but I knew, knew how significant uh, his mom was um, and didn't really, he didn't really talk much about his dad. And I, you know, I just had these nice little connections with him personally, um, you know, not having a dad um, that was present in my life and just the significance of my mom and my story um, really connected with that with him. So, you know, in the midst of that, here we have this, uh, this individual that is a legacy. He is a legacy to um, adult uh, animation, adult cartoon. Um, and, you know, so we have all that in the mix there that was playing in this piece. So I definitely see it as a longer form project that I would like uh, to extend. It's sitting at a 20 right now, and I'm just really thankful to share this project at Lower East Side, so thanks. Yeah, um, well, we're happy to to host you. Um, and and just to give a little more context about Space Ghost, I think that's something that uh, myself and also some other folks uh, at the festival might not know that much about. Tell mm. us a little bit about Space Ghost and that legacy of wow. you know, how he was so well known in the animation community. Um, I mean, in the film, you're visiting like conventions and he's signing autographs and he's you know a very big deal to to certain folks, but it's a it's an yeah. interesting slice of uh, the industry. Yeah, yeah. So he he describes the format, um, you know, like Dada was to art. Um, that's that's how we approached the show itself. And so if you could take like a put the context of a late night, you know, uh, talk show host um, format. I uh, was basically utilizing that format and putting it in an animation context with this um, this superhero. But you know, from what I've discovered and understanding of how the writing and everything worked on this piece was, um, they would bring in celebrities. You know, and I think I I highlight like Hulk Hogan uh, in this, but you know, um, frontman of REM, just all these big big uh, cultural icons from the '90s would have been. Uh, really involved in the show so they would bring them in and they would they would sit and do an interview with them but then they would um, completely flip uh, the context of the interviews on edge and then he was banter George Lowe would banter with those characters and so forth and just and again uh, it was more of an adult based show that was built on that late night format um, but it was so I think I think he doesn't get a lot of credence for his and this is where I was talking about these twisty surrealist jabs. Um, I think the show itself gets, you know, a lot of attention on the writers and different things like that. But his his ability to ad lib and add to those things, I think, is what made the the success of that show. And here he is at the end of his career, um, trying to find his way in the in the middle of this dilemma. Um, and not being recognized for the significance that he had in that show and the legacy of that show and that long-term um, impact. So I'm hoping to highlight that in this piece and sort of honor him. Uh, and I believe in him as a creative so much. And I just, I spent time with him as he works on his own art and so forth. I'm really drawn to his work from that standpoint as well. Well, yeah, I think you, you, you know, it's an interesting point too. And it's something that we kind of see in everybody's film here is you sometimes from the outside feel like um, people in the industry or um, they have it all together. Or we're, we're supposed to assume that everything's going as planned and, and everybody's, you know, very powerful directors or actors or, you know, whatever it is. And each yeah. film kind of shows us a little bit behind that curtain and that like, it might not be, you know, as, as shiny as you expect. And I think, especially with your film, it's really, you know, I really enjoyed the way you kind of presented 
the dichotomy between, you know, he's, like you said, he's ending his career, he's, but he's, so he's taking, you know, voiceover work for, you know, local car commercials or whatever it is on the radio. And he's got to make, you know, pay the bills to, to kind of feed this art obsession mm -hmm. um, that really is what connects him and his mom, you know, in a lot of ways too. So I think that was really um, well done and, and kind of, you know, a little bit like it's bittersweet, but it was really interesting mm -hmm. to, to see. So I thought that was, that was yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you definitely hit like some of those key moments where in, in the filming process, you know, anytime that he would talk about his mom, he was, he was so, I wouldn't say aggressive in a, in a sense, but make sure, you know, make sure you focus on this. Look, look, did you get that shot? Did you get that shot of my mom? You know, just those little things just really um, shows that this is all his connection to the significance of his mom in that. And yeah, definitely he's a friend at this point, which is awesome. And um, yeah, so great. Well, that, I was gonna say that's good that he's a friend, obviously now, but what was it like in the beginning? I mean, he seems like a little bit of a, less agreeable subject than you might want for a documentary <laughs> yeah oh yeah so you know um his dog is you know like his closest and you know i think that celebrityism um i think is a hard thing for him and in building like a deep-rooted um relationship i think has been struggle for him and i you sort of sense that a little bit um now you know he's extremely well connected and all those things um, but yeah, I, I think I was intrigued with some of those characteristics of him as an individual. Um, but his sincerity is so real. And I think that's from a filmmaker dilemma is there. Like, what do you present of, you know, this character and who he is, um, and try to bring authenticity to that. Um, that was that ethical dilemma that I was facing, um, throughout the piece. Well, yeah, I think that was a delicate line to, to walk and you did a, a good job of that. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing that we've been, uh, you know, also talking to everyone about, especially all these films, like about the industry, about, um, a filmmaking, uh, we want to hear from you guys too. What is something that you're, um, watching or you're really excited about or a film that, um, just seen, or, you know, we, we ask everybody just to give us a quick rec on something that they're really excited about. It doesn't have to be you know, highbrow, oh, I'm a film expert. It can be, you know, whatever you recently watched. Um, but, uh, oh, I, and I, I can't believe I, I do this every time I decide to ask this question without thinking about what my answer would be. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've done a few of these now, so I don't want to say the same thing that I said last time. Um, but, oh, I, I do have a new one. I, I can say, um, I just started watching Legendary on HBO Max, um, which is a doc doc competition show about like the uh, the ball and voguing community, um, and um, it's really it's I don't normally like competition style shows in that way, but it's like very much taking a really cool like fast paced documentary approach to how it's captured and. And my background's in documentary filmmaking, so I'm very like always like interested to see how how to keep re refreshing it, especially for a competition show, um, so you don't make it like American Idol or whatever. But anyway, highly recommend if uh, anyone has HBO Max, or if you don't, I I'll have a login, I'll share it. You know, it's a new streamer, so. <laughs> but that's mine. Um, how about Aiden? What's yours? I uh, I watch a lot of Rick and Morty. Uh, uh... <laughs> I'm trying to think of something more highbrow this whole time, but I... It doesn't have to be highbrow. A lot of people have said Rick and Morty, so don't feel... Oh, ashamed. really? Well, <laughs> then I'm lowbrow and unoriginal, so this, that sucks. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It just means it's good. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. um, how about you, Ron? Uh, I, I've been kind of like the typical... Uh, going through withdrawal from not having basketball this season, so I'm about... I'm starting the Michael Jordan doc. Um, but then I also, I went back, I don't know, yeah, documentary is definitely interesting to me. I'm interested in what you guys were just talking about with Will and Williams film. Um, but I'm also, I went back and started Third Rock from the Sun because, <laughs> you know, John Lithgow is the best <laughs> and Jane Curtin is incredible. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> that's my little, little sitcom 
uh, mind where uh, that's at. So where, that's my wreck. <laughs> where are you watching Third Rock from the Sun? Is that um, Hulu? It's on, wait, what? Where are you even watching that? Oh, it's on Amazon Prime. Um, it's all on there. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. Oh, I'm also watching Upload. Which I know. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> that was actually Sorry. my job. I should have yeah, said I was watching Upload. upload. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was supposed upload to do. Upload on Amazon Prime. It's terrific. Yeah. Hmm. He has to plug that because uh, it's in his contract. That's what I was gonna say. Like suspiciously uh, promotional. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> terrific uh, show. Great. Um, what about you, Grace? You know, I just started watching Mrs. America, um, starting Kate Blanchett about the ERA agreement in the 1970s, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm on episode six. Nice. Yeah, I've been watching that too. It's, yeah. um, I think I have one or two left. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, a lot of stuff in there that I sadly didn't know enough about. Exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about you, Foster? Um, I... I have on my list to watch this weekend the first two episodes of uh, Dirty John, the Betty Broderick story, um, which I had the pleasure of shadowing the director on the, the finale, which is episode eight. So it's an eight part series. Um, so it's a, a completely separate season uh, story from the first season of Dirty John. Um, but it's, I've read it all because I was shadowing her. So it's incredible. And Amanda P and Christian Slater are just like, mm -hmm amazing so uh and i got to watch them work so i'm super excited the first two episodes they're on i can't remember what channel it's on cable but it's also on youtube i believe so um highly recommend it for a period piece and also super female forward um these characters are just like yeah awesome maggie directed and she's an amazing job yeah i i want to watch that i forgot that was coming out um yeah. you you on, the last, on the last episode the last episode of the Oh, I yeah. shadowed the director on the episode eight of, of this season that's just coming out. Tierra Scobie's in that in this season, right? I don't know. Uh, not on the episode I was on, but oh, okay. maybe. I think she's. Oh, I sorry. Yeah, I just was wondering if you knew. Her. It, no, I don't. I I don't. Um, but it was a, a really great. Um, yeah, I heard great it. Great project and like who, who was very the director? Intense. Who is the director on that? Maggie Kylie directed four of the eight episodes. So the, oh, sweet. the pilot and the and two, four and five, and then the last one, eight. So that'd be really uh, cool to be able to direct the first episode of something and, I'll, and like be able to direct the last episode. So nice she did the same thing with Katie Keene. Um, she oh, directed okay. the pilot and the, the season finale. Um, mm -hmm. So she's, she's unstoppable. You have to watch her work. That's she's so, so sweet. So I will. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Roxy. Hi, Jack. Okay. <laughs> I'm loving this. This is great. <laughs> uh, but what about for you, William? What's your recommendation? Oh, man. Okay. So I, I feel like I've been um, stale in what I'm watching lately these days. Um, but I, I am drawn to Arthur Lipset's work recently, um, Canadian Studio B filmmaker. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to look towards that next project. So I'm a media ecologist, so I'm looking. So this piece that I did was focusing more on the voice, on the voice, and my past documentary was on the pencil. Um, so I am looking for a medium um, to, to build some type of a story around. Um, but I've been drawn a little bit towards that um, the abstract stuff at this point right now, just for some inspiration. Cool. That sounds very highbrow. Uh, oh. <laughs> I mean, it's no third rock from the sun, but <laughs> <laughs> I did just watch The Last Kingdom. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but um, yeah, that was probably the series that I just finished. But awesome. Um, well, you know, normally this is the part where we would go all hang out at the bar where we have the free wine at the Lower East Side Film Festival. Oh. <laughs> Many who have come known about that, but um, we can't do that today. But um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to talk and chat. And, you know, it's good to see some faces, um, put, some, put some faces to some names. Um, and thank you so much for your work, too, and thinking of us when you're submitting. And, um, you know, I hope that you guys continue to, to make great stuff and, and think of us when you're doing it. Um, and I'll say goodbye but i don't have to hang up right away so if you guys want to continue chatting or whatever i'll say um 
All right, guys, thank you so much for joining. This is the In the Biz Short Showcase from the Lower East Side Film Festival. Thank you guys all so much um, and look forward to posting this, uh, posting your work again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you, Rossi. Yeah.